it, the spirit of fear hurting the church. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Second Timothy 1 and 7. The fear of the Lord is important to the spiritual motif of every Christian. The Bible tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One and understanding. Proverbs 9 and 10. Our understanding of holiness and righteousness is sincerely grounded on understanding and believing that God is the creator of the universe. Christians cannot believe that we need a savior without embracing the truth of a monotheistic God that is jealous. A God that is jealous, vengeful, and angry, and who still loves us, and predestines all facets of our lives. Some scholars believe that this is not the true character of a real God that created us for purpose. However, in order to make a presumption so boldly, we must look at the possibility of God being a father to us. Meaning, many parental characteristics are similar to the same characteristics outlined. Jealousy, vengeance, and angry. Additionally, Genesis provides a better synopsis of who we are as created beings. The scripture invites us to read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. Genesis 1, 26 through the 27 verse. Many of the writers have painted God as a God who loves and cares, which is absolutely true. However, the image, the likeness, and the dominion of God allows him to have times of resentment, positiveness, and punishment toward his children. Therefore, once we are able to understand that God has feelings and desires to be loved and respected by his children, whom he created for the sole purpose of companionship and worship, then it would be harder to believe that our rebellion and rejection of God's predestined plan for our lives would not cause God to feel some type of way. Boa makes a great point. We are constantly in danger of letting the world instead of God define us. The Bible provides the believer in Christ with views of God's love when he was constantly delivering the Israelites from themselves. Yet, the Israelites constantly rejected God when they desired to have a king to rule over them and their worship of other gods. They told the prophet Samuel that they wanted a king to rule over them and not God. This hurt God because the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which I have done since the day that I have brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. Now, therefore, 
heed their voice. God gave them what they desired most, but it came at a huge price. God continues to tell Samuel to let his chosen people know this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for as his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before the chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. Will set some of the plow to his ground and reap his harvest. And some will make weapons of war and equipments for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourself. And the Lord will not hear you in this day. 1 Samuel 8, 11 through 18. Also, as Christians, our belief system is founded upon the first written verse of the book of Genesis as it pronounces, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's found in Genesis 1 and 1. The process of understanding who God is and why he created us takes a lifelong journey that includes struggles, defeats, joy, sorrow, life, death, pain, anger, forgiveness, and peace. The Bible provides us with an overarching creed that allows us to believe he is God and that we should also believe to not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41 and 10. King David provided us with a prayer that helps us find faith instead of fear. He experienced so many problems that are still relevant to many of us today. You see, David was a man after God's own heart. God loved David and was with him throughout everything that he did. One of the things that David did was murder. God was very displeased with an appointed king of the chosen people disobeying one of the Ten Commandments that said, Thou shalt not kill. Yet he did. And even though he killed and committed other sins, God still heard his prayers. However, this was not because David was good or righteous. This was because David believed in God in his heart. He believed that God would never leave him. And he wanted to wholeheartedly please God as well. David's faith and trust in God was unwavering. David prayed these words when he was facing his darkest moment. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalms 23, 4 first. Fear strangles our ability to trust God like David did, especially when we know that we have sins that were willingly committed and sins we thought about doing or feelings of sins that we held in our hearts. We must remember that God sees the heart, and it is the heart that God judges. 
God still loves us, but our relationship with him must be succinct with prayer and worship to ensure that in those moments of rebellion, God's love and mercy will keep us from completely running away from him. Just as Adam gave God an excuse, the woman you gave to me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. We must not allow fear and shame to keep us accountable to God enough to fight for our relationship and closeness to him. The spirit of fear tells us that we are not worthy of God's love or forgiveness. The spirit of fear also plants doubt and mistrust of others. This opens the doorway to demonic influences that continue to feed our hearts and minds by escalating insecure thoughts and imaginations against others in our concentric circles. And as a result, we begin to speak negatively over their lives and project our fears onto others by failing to exercise our faith to others or praying for them and telling our testimony of triumph and blessings. The spirit of fear stifles our willingness to share Jesus and the blessings that has happened. Ultimately, this fear tries to justify itself by saying that we were born this way or I get these feelings and characteristics from my parent. When there should be a transformation and renewal of our hearts and minds to be willing to cast aside the fear and love, look to the Holy Spirit to lead us informatively enough and show us that we believe and know God is with us wherever we go. In the Bible, the Amplified Version shows how Apostle Paul had feared As he began to preach to the church of Corinth, he said, And when I came to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming to you the testimony of God concerning salvation through Christ, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, no lofty words or eloquent or a philosophy as a Greek orator might do. For I made the decision to know nothing, that is, to forego philosophical or theological discussions regarding inconsequential things and opinions, while among you accept Jesus Christ and in him crucified and the meaning of his redemptive death and his resurrection. I came to you in a state of weakness and fear and great trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom using clever rhetoric, but they were delivered in demonstration of the Holy Spirit operating through me and of his power stirring the minds of the listeners and persuading them so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom and rhetoric of men, but on the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter 1st and 5th verse. First, in order to understand that we are created to worship and praise our creator of life, we must understand that he is a multifaceted God that requires that we must Bow before him in reverence and humility whenever we seek his guidance and mercy for our lives. This reverence is not because of what questions God would answer. Our reverence to him must be because he is transcendent and intrinsic. Paul understood this because he acknowledged the fact that he was afraid to speak on behalf of the Lord to a nation of people who had an established religious system in place. And many of them were intelligent and very knowledgeable about their religious belief. 
But Paul understood that he had to cast aside his fears and trust in the Holy Spirit's ability to speak through him to stir the power of God in the minds of people who had never heard of Jesus Christ and the God of all gods. It is important to not wear the spirit of fear as believers in Christ because it does not reveal the confidence in knowing and believing that Jesus promised us that we will have a comforter and a teacher to help us. His promise that the Holy Spirit will be teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you in perpetuity, regardless of the circumstance and on every occasion, uh, even to the ends of the age. A.W. Tozer helps explain the overall spiritual change from fear to faith in Paul as he began to speak to the churches of Corinth. Tozer tells us we must seek the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit's relationship to the Son and the Son's love of the Father to lead us into all truth. Tozer says, let any man turn to God in earnest. Let him begin to exercise himself unto godliness. Let him seek to develop his powers of spiritual receptivity by trusting and obedience and humility. And the results will exceed anything he may have hoped in his leaner and weaker days. Knowing God must begin with a personal commitment to trust him when we are encountering someone who does not have a relationship with him. We often meet people who have listened to other people's opinions about God and their assumptions of who God is and that God is not a loving God, God kills babies, or God does not exist. And finally, God is weaker than the gods they serve. The spirit of fear will tell the believer that they do not know God strongly enough to apologetically expound on God to others. But that's on the contrary. It is our personal testimony of faith and mercy that we can always share with others. You know, our personal testimony of how God delivered us from certain sins and vices that was destroying our bodies, sins that was keeping us in mental or physical bondage, and sins that alienated us from our loved ones due to religious, political, and social beliefs. Our testimonies are the closest book of the Bible that many others will see or read. We are the 67th book of the Bible. That's why Paul's pronouncement to the Corinthians are so profound because it reveals the humanity and vulnerability of Paul to others while showing that his strength comes from a higher source that loves him and believes that he is worthy of the work he is assigned to complete. Proclaiming Christ and our salvation is the main purpose of our Christian faith, which is to go and tell others about Jesus, the Christ who died for our sins and who we can be reconciled back to our Creator if we choose to accept the offering of salvation. Alexander notes that God has two names that are specific to his divinity. In Hebrew translation, God is repeatedly referred to as Elohim, what provides a general designation for a deity. However, Yahweh is a person's name. Alexander continues to make an invaluable point with regards to the serpent's understanding of who God was in the general sense of being Elohim and not the personal reference of Yahweh. Moreover, it should be complementary instead of contradictory 
when we view the scriptural descriptions of God in Genesis because it allows us to view the creation in both perspectives. Each perspective provides us with an overarching point of view that God created earth and it became his dwelling place prior to the fall. Consequently, the fall instigated emotions in all mankind from this pivotal point forward that were not present when man and woman were created. The Bible tells us that Adam and Eve became ashamed and they concealed themselves from God. Genesis, the third chapter, seven through the eighth verse, illustrates how Adam and Eve's eyes became open due to their disobedience, which caused new revelation of what they perceived as incomplete work by God. It tells us that Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But God does not want anyone to be lost because of an inherited rebellious nature. This is why he sent Jesus to be the reconciliation of sin and the redeemer of sinfulness by dying at Calvary. The spirit of fear allows us to place more emphasis on the patterns of sin in a person instead of emphasizing love and service to those that are struggling and hurting from their sins. Resisting sin is not the primary focus of the Christian because sometimes we can struggle with destructive behavior our entire Christian lives. Yet, the struggle does not have to define our relationship with Christ. The process of sanctification, loving, and serving others must be met without fear and with total faith that redemption is available to everyone who believes that they can have it. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immorality, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's found in Revelation, the 21st chapter, 8th verse. Revelation 21, 8 tells us that there are consequences to fear that allows us to continue in indecisive worship and reverence to God. We must not allow the bondage of fear to justify our willingness to incorporate sinful thoughts, acts, or deeds to filter into our lives while we profess our faith and belief in God. God's reaction to sin was written for the Jewish and Hellenistic communities that were learned and able to read ancient texts from the Old Testament religious leaders. Many leaders and teachers who have written books in the Bible did not have the privilege of following a written account of God's ways and how he dealt with sin. Our accountability is greater because the Bible has been given to us as a moral, ethical, and spiritual guide. Therefore, our conduct as believers, has the capacity to exhibit holiness, godliness, and commitment. However, by the time Jesus was born, only Jewish leaders and a few Gentiles had access to the scriptures. Other believers accessed the knowledge of God and the redemptive actions from verbal pass downs and eyewitness accounts. You know, this is important to understand just how important it is for everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is Lord to not be afraid to witness and tell their testimony to everyone who would listen because it helps us embrace a mandate that Jesus presented to his disciples on two occasions. The first occasion was when he was resurrected and was at the tomb and Mary Magdalene thought that he was a gardener at the tomb until she heard Jesus call her name. Jesus said, Mary? She turned to him, Rabboni? 
which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascended to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. This was the first account after Jesus was resurrected from the grave. His mandate to Mary Magdalene should not be easily overlooked when we are studying the resurrection. Not only does it cauterize the wounds of women being justified by grace through faith, it begins the process of evangelism and discipleship. When we read the early biblical accounts of Eve's fall from God by suggesting to Adam to eat from the forbidden tree, Eve's actions started the process of sin. Now, we see many women generations later. Christ uses a woman to spread the news of atonement of man's sins and the redemption of his father's creation. Kostenberger made a a great point to tell us that Mary Magdalene was one of Jesus' most committed female followers. Additionally, at the moment, Mary went to tell the disciples that Jesus had risen. The law of sin no longer held mankind under the conviction of Adam and Eve, for a way of reconciliation was established. And what some believe how sin was introduced into the world by a woman, others may supposition that the good news of salvation in this moment was spoken by a woman. The good news of Christ's resurrection is considered the gospel because it is the sharing of the gospel good news, and it is what allows others who are sinful or without a savior to know that there is eternal life and they have a renewed path toward holiness and a closer connection to God if they believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. A.W. Tozer captures the physical and spiritual character of man in the frame of time from Jesus' commission of Mary, telling the disciple of his resurrected holiness to the time that he ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of his father. Toza states, The natural man is blind to holiness. He may fear God's power and admire his wisdom, but his holiness he cannot even imagine. The world needs reconciliation back to holiness. God's holiness is not simply the best we know infinitely better. God's holiness is unique and unapproachable. That is why Jesus' resurrection is necessary. He is the advocate and atonement for every act of disobedience and rebellion that men and women committed on earth. That is why Mary's role as messenger of grace and mercy should be looked upon significantly. More importantly, it reveals that the first commission started with Mary, a true follower of Jesus in life and resurrection. Jesus gave her the first commission to go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascended to my father and your father and my God and your God. Imagine how Mary may have felt to witness rejuvenation and resurrection of the Christ, whom she witnessed three days ago dying on a cross in a shameful and detestable manner between two thieves beaten, spat on, and whipped to unbearable pain, suffering, and anguish throughout his entire body. Yet, her faith was restored because she had a renewed encounter with Jesus. 
the excitement that she must have had to to know that she was no longer alone and the anointed one had risen just like he told them. Her faith was overflowing as she immediately obeyed the words of Jesus. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Many of us can agree that hearing Jesus' voice when feeling that all hope is lost and when disbelief grows and the sense of being totally defeated by the actions of sin is such a sweet sound that it is indescribable, empowering, and hopeful. Just when she believed that all hope was lost, there was Christ calling her name and appearing to her when she was at her darkest, broken, and most fearful moment. Jesus called to her by name, Mary. Fear was erased, anger was eliminated, and hope was restored. A scripture comes to mind that puts in perspective If one should put themselves in Mary's position, a relative passage found in Psalm 34th chapter 19 through the 21st verse. And it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him from them all. He kept all his bones, not one of them was broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. For Mary, she has a testimony of faith and hope because she heard sermons and parables during the life of Jesus that he would be killed and will rise in three days. She also heard that he must endure the crucifixion so that the scriptures can be fulfilled and sins atoned for. For many people, who experience something as terrible as a loved one being killed, we must not develop fear and hatred in our hearts against the person who harmed us and against God for not stopping the hurt and pain. Fear will only see anger, and anger only reveals sin in the hearts of a person who allow fear to rule their hearts. That person is just the right person that demonic influences wants to inhabit and hopes to get them to stop trusting and believing that Jesus is there, knocking on their hearts to comfort and heal them. Jesus told us that he will be with us and we will not be alone but have faith in God. He sent us a teacher and comforter to help us and teach us to hear the voice of holiness. However, many cannot hear the voice of Jesus calling out to help them because they are hurting and so angry that they begin to unknowingly practice witchcraft against others by speaking negatively or casting spells of anger, hatred, and destruction into their lives. Demonic influences are the instigator of fear and shame. But as a believer in Christ, Jesus revealed that he is the atonement and the life over all demonic thinking and influences of fear and anger. When we truly believe and trust that God is able to do anything and everything that we petition him for, then we should be able to resist temptation of immediate satisfaction and indulgences that sway the soul and body away from walking in obedience and holiness to God. Remember, God's purpose for mankind is to worship and adore Him, but we are constantly intertwined in rebellion and sinful attachments that we constantly need to stay connected to God through Christ. The words that we speak out of our mouths can bring life or death. Proverbs 18th chapter 21st verse reiterates that life and death are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. 
The word and deed of man must remain connected to the hopes of pleasing God and having a heart that shows God that you love him and need salvation and grace until it's time for us to journey to a better place in Christ. When we abolish the use of speaking negatively about others, and when we turn from thinking angrily against someone who may have wronged us, we can start to incorporate the teachings of Jesus as he told us. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We are the armor bearers of the Christian faith, and therefore we must continue by faith, teaching the grace and mercy without hesitation, just as Mary and the disciples committed themselves to reach the world and proclaim Christ as Savior to anyone who listened. Now, With the evidence of salvation and the Holy Spirit, it is our job to go and tell others that Jesus Christ is alive. He's alive in us.